السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every opportunity that he gives us to get closer to him, to earn closeness to him and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us lead a life such that as the days pass we become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the day we actually die we would be the closest we ever were to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that being the case Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy we beseech and we ask for, we hope for and we have complete hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at us with the eyes of mercy complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless his entire household all those who have struggled and strove through the years the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the scholars of Islam who have preserved and protected the deen may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all my brothers and sisters why do we start this way that's a very important question Many times people think, why do we need to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim at the beginning of something? That goes straight back to the narration of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Kullu amalin lam yubtada ufihi bismillahi fahuwa akta. And according to another narration, uh, meaning the, the, the narration, the meaning of it is every important matter, Kullu amrin dhi balin, everything that is of importance that is not started off in the name of Allah shall be cut off, cut off of goodness, cut off of blessing, cut off of, uh, you know, success and so on, the ultimate success. So anything you're doing that's of importance, say Bismillah. The most important thing that you and I could be doing at this particular moment in order to keep us alive is eating. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> You eat in order to be alive. You are alive, you can think. You eat healthy, you can think healthy. You don't eat healthy, subhanAllah, the doctors will confirm that if you don't eat healthy, what would happen? Automatically, your mind would suffer because of either a chemical imbalance or minerals, nutrients, deficiency of some vitamin, something. And something would go wrong, definitely physically. The same applies when it comes to uh, food that is perhaps not halal, what would happen is it has an immediate impact because we would find that we would lack in the minerals and vitamins of a spiritual nature, the way we think, the way we look or the way we make decisions, all that would be contaminated be because we would be lacking vitamin T and that is taqwa, the, 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 the fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to consumption. So it's important for us to say bismillah even when slaughtering an animal. It's important for us to say Bismillah when we're putting the halal morsel in our mouths. It's important for us to say Bismillah when opening the door of the vehicle. It's important for us to say Bismillah when we are driving, when we are walking, when we leave the house. Sometimes there is something added to the Bismillah from the Sunnah and sometimes there is nothing added. Sometimes it is voluntary to add it and sometimes you don't add it. Let me give you some examples. When we are leaving the house, we say Bismillah and then we add on to it, tawakkaltu ala Allah. In the name of Allah, I lay my complete trust in Allah because I'm leaving my house. I ask Allah to look after this home of mine, to look after me as I've left the home. And then we say, Bismillah, majreha wa mursaha, inna rabbi la ghafurur rahim. I'm sure you would know the dua when we're on, a, a, uh, on an animal or in a motor vehicle, on a conveyance that we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the ultimate controller of the item that we are driving. We are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us, grant us barakah. There is a long dua, beautiful one when going out on a journey. And I suggest that when we're going out on a long journey, let us look at the dua from the sunnah, from a book or from the internet, and we try and read it because it adds in it, Allahumma anta sahibu fi safar. Oh Allah, you are the companion in journey. When we are traveling, you are our companion. We have you as our companion. Well, Khalifa to fil ahl. Oh Allah, you are the one whom we've left behind at home, and you are the one who will protect the entire family. You are the, Subhanallah. This is a powerful dua, and then it continues to say, Oh Allah, protect us from the evil of this journey, and Oh Allah, grant us barakah in this journey. Oh Allah, safeguard our family, our wealth in our absence. Oh Allah, make the journey uh, easy for us. Let us not feel the length of it. Beautiful dua. So that's Bismillah. The same applies when we are talking to each other. If it's for example, 
uh, and I, something has just come to my mind that's very, very interesting. Uh, but let, before I say that, let me tell you what I was about to say. And that is, when I'm talking to you, I don't have to say, Bismillah, how are you, my brother? And you say, Bismillah, I'm fine, my brother. Because that is hiwar, that's the speech. You know, I said Bismillah when I left home. If that was the case, we would be saying Bismillah for every single item. That Bismillah is already in the heart. But something important, you know, uh, I've officiated a lot of nikahs. I'm, I'm sure you know what that means. You know, where we ask the, the groom that have you accepted her uh, in your nikah? And mashallah, you get so many different responses, replies. Sometimes we teach them what to say. So there was a young boy who was in quite a bit of a rush and he was excited. He had an adrenaline rush at the same time. So he's so excited, he's looking at his clock and he's saying, this sheikh is taking too long. Anyway, we got to the question. So I said, have you accepted her in your nikah? He said, yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking at him now, it's an official occasion. Yeah, is fine. Wallahi, yeah, yeah, is actually fine. But it's official, so I wanted to get something good from him. So I told him, hey, listen. I, I looked at him, he said, yeah. I said, say, yes, I have accepted. So he said, yes, you have accepted. <laughs> I said, hey, not me, you, subhanallah. So this is some of the excitement that we've witnessed, you know. Don't worry, it doesn't mean I, I ended up marrying her by mistake. But what it does mean is that his intention was what he meant. And everyone knew that, he, that by saying that, yes, you have, meaning, you know, this is what it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us goodness. In fact, to, be, to, to just correct it, I said, say, yes, you have. So he said, yes, you have, you know. So, so subhanallah, may Allah grant us goodness. But going back to this whole point of Bismillah, one day I heard, first time and last time, well, so far, I've heard in my life, when an imam asked a certain man in, in our presence at Masjid al-Falah here, he says, have you accepted in your nikah? He said, Bismillah, subhanallah. He started off by saying, Bismillah, walhamdulillah. In the name of Allah, all praise is due to Allah. Yes, I have accepted her. And wallahi, that just gave me the shivers. It actually raised my hair. Because when I got married, I didn't think of that. Bismillah, walhamdulillah. In the name of Allah and all thanks is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Yes, I've accepted her. Mashallah, mashallah. May Allah grant us barakah in our marriages. Some, I, you know, some people, if you were to ask them today, what did you say? They'd say, I forgot to say, a'udhu billah. That's why shaitan has come in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So getting back to the basmala, it's called a basmala. That's in the Arabic language to say bismillah. They would say, sammillah, say the name of Allah. And it's called a basmala. Bismillah or bismillahir rahmanir rahim. So if we are, for example, doing anything important, you say bismillah, mashallah, tabarakallah. So this talk that I'm having with you right now is extremely important because the nature of it is such that we are trying to learn something. We want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the intention. I'm not here because I want anything from you. And that's something we need to get clear. And, and you are not here because you want to gain something from me that is monetary or perhaps, you know, material. But rather, it is solely for the pleasure of Allah. I want to be boosted, motivated, learn a thing or two for the pleasure of Allah. Be, you know, go away think, being able to understand the plan of Allah for me and for everyone else. And this would make me a better person Person, it would make me, uh, you know, uh, more acquainted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and what he wants from me. And so I would be able to act upon it. So it would also encourage me. Because wallahi, when we come like tonight, mashallah, large numbers, you know, it's not so easy to come. Salah of Isha is quite late these days. And, uh, you know, a guy like me goes on talking. And this is what sometimes, you know, people feel maybe, or I think that people think that perhaps I speak a little bit too long, although no one's actually told it to me. And here we have people, you know, some are shaking their heads and some are nodding their heads. So Allah make it easy for us. But if I am taking a little bit too long, you know, this is a home crowd. You can actually put up your hand and tell me, hey, you know, we need to go and sleep. And a lot of these uncles that are here, I respect them so much, I would actually say no problem. Now, I wouldn't bring you the bedding in that right here, but I, I wouldn't mind, you know, and we would end it. Because I am actually a son of this community, and I'm happy to be having elders who are here in front of me, uh, who can always even guide me where I'm going wrong, alhamdulillah. So, subhanallah, it's something important. That's why we start off by saying, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. Then we thank Allah, walhamdulillah. You know, this is the minimum that you should be doing. I thank Allah. Why am I thanking Allah? I, alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. He's given me this opportunity, you know, to execute what I'm about to execute. And then we have to say, was salatu was salamu ala abdillahi wa rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. That's the minimum. So we say, 
and peace and blessings be upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Because he, Allah chose him to be the best of creation and the final prophet, the most noble of all the messengers. And he came to us. We are so fortunate to be from amongst his ummah. Do you know that? So fortunate, but we don't realize it. So what was his mission? To come and teach us, to come and tell us. That goodness that we say comes from Allah was brought by a certain human being known as Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the highest of all creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We owe him that blessings and salutations, what we're about to say is connected somehow to what he has taught. Subhanallah. So we owe that to him. And this is why when we say at the beginning of a talk, was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah, we should all be uttering the term sallallahu alayhi wa at least within ourselves. Bare minimum. Because another narration says, destruction be upon he who hears my name and does not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, does not send blessings and salutations upon it. And subhanallah, this was actually uh, a hadith that we learn from uh, and it's something very important. But on the other hand, Allah has encouraged us. You see, one hand, and this is the beauty of the Sharia. We are mere mortals. We are human beings. You know, when we want to say something, we either keep quiet. We either go around beating about the bush so no one gets the message. Or we are brave enough to say it as it is in face flat. And subhanallah, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine system, he does it in a unique way that we cannot compete with, but we can learn from. Definitely. So what does he do? On one hand, he says, whoever does not send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu when they hear his name, they, they are doomed, so to speak. That's what the hadith says, right? Which means destruction be upon them, they are doomed. So when a person does not say it intentionally, then we will confirm that they are asking for that dooming. But when a person, if, for example, slips up, we will say, hey brother, you know what, let's try and conscientize ourselves a little bit more. There's actually a competition on a Friday, every Friday, for the person who says the, 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 the salawat the most from everyone. So if you start mourning and you say, Sallallahu ala Muhammad, for example, it's actually, uh, you know, sending blessings and salutations upon him. Or, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And there are thousands of ways of sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a competition. Let's try and win it at least once, even if it means just in our community. Allahu Akbar. May Allah help us. It's something we take lightly, but one Friday, how many Fridays do we see? 50, 52 Fridays a year approximately? You know, one of them at least, let's try and win by the will of Allah. Let's make it this, uh, you know, sort of encouragement to, our, to, to ourselves to say, one of the Fridays, inshallah, we'll try and win that competition. It's not difficult. But on the other hand, whilst the, the, the warning is there, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيَّ وَاحِدَةً صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ بِهَا عشرة. Whoever sends blessings upon me once, Allah sends blessings upon them ten times as a result of what they just did. So when you are saying blessings and salutations upon Muhammad you are being blessed completely tenfold by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu ala Muhammad. Even if you say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that alone is enough to say I've sent blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you want to add Something to it, you can say, Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. His family. Okay, so now I've just spoken about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the importance of sending blessings and salutations upon him. The warning on one hand and the goodness on the other. Like I say, with us, we just fire as is. With Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, yes, it's as clear as it is. There's warnings on one hand and there's good news on the other. So that's the divine balance. It always comes in the Quran. When you hear about Jannah and paradise, immediately you will hear about Jahannam and you will hear about hellfire. So it balances. You know, they say, hey, don't get too excited. Remember, there's another side there. And at the same time, when you hear about hellfire and the burning in it and what will happen to the intestines and what will happen to this and what, and what goes on here and there, immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hey, hang on, hang on. There's a lot of hope. There's also paradise and this is what it is. That's Allah's plan. So if we take a look at uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brought us all the goodness we have. So every droplet of goodness that we engage in, he is getting a full reward of my entire action. And the actions of those who taught me and every single person who taught them, who taught them, who taught them, going right back to Muhammad sallallahu without any form of uh, subtraction of the rewards of any one of them. 
This is a multiplication. This is why teach as many people as you can. Don't worry about others. For example, if someone is trying to distract you, you go and you, you know, relay the message. Today I sent out a message and I'm sure a lot of you, it actually went viral. It was more a, a, a private sort of a message. But Alhamdulillah, since it went viral, it went. And to be honest with you, I was so happy that at least on the day of Qiyamah, I can stand and say, oh Allah, I conveyed. I'm not worried what happens as a result. I mean, the intention was not really, it wasn't a dirty one. It's not malice. It's not something full of hatred. No way. It's just a reality. It's, I've got nothing to do with this whole thing. Besides the fact that I've got a duty unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what I know, let me relate it to the people. And that's all I did. And if someone doesn't like it, no problem. They, to be honest with you, they don't owe their answers to me, nor do I owe my answers to them. So people are free to do what they want. But we are instructed to just inform the people that, hey, hang on, there's something to this that I think you just need to know. And I'm so happy that everyone knows. So at least now, those who've still chosen to do whatever they want, they've, they should have done so according to knowledge they have. That's all. And we've been taught in Islam how to handle situations of this nature where there's a dispute regarding something. The hadith clearly says, and it's a hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu anhu, in Sahih Muslim, he says, halal is very clear, undoubted, undisputed. That is halal. Inna al bayin. That's the hadith. Sahih Muslim, narrated by Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu. He says, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu say loud and clear, halal is extremely clear and haram is extremely clear. And in the middle, there are certain items that are disputed. They are gray. Gray to who? To me and you, not to Allah. Allah knows. But to you and I, we might be disputing. So the hadith says, Whoever stays away from disputed territory has protected his deen and himself. He's protected himself because nobody can argue with you that you did something wrong. Brother, you heard there was a dispute. What did you do? I just stayed away from it. So the people will say, well done. Because no one can ever say you did something wrong. Imagine, the hadith says, whoever falls into great territory is falling head on into haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So uh, the reason I say this is because it's not easy to utter things. It's not easy to say things. And sometimes we find we found not only in our society, but even on a global level, those who are able to utter the truth, their numbers are diminishing. And to be honest with you, their bravery is actually decreasing because they are threatened, they are sworn, they are scoffed at. Because today, subhanAllah, may Allah protect us all. We all know that when you utter what is upright and the truth, you lose popularity very fast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So if, if that is the concern and the worry of a person like me, and may Allah really protect us, it's very, very difficult. Believe me, there are certain things that we, we perhaps won't be able to ever say uh, in a way that we should have. But we say it however we can. But these little items, to be honest with you, petty matters of society, they're actually very, very small if you look at them in comparison to main issues that we have in, 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 on a global level. However, to be honest with you, uh, those who, who actually build up the courage are terrorized. They are actually demonized. And what happens is, you have to just be a person who's strong enough to say, here's my name, this is what I've said, and I stand by it. And there you are. And you don't have to agree with it because your answerability is not to me, it's just to Allah. But please do me a favor and read it and ask yourself, why would this person say such a thing? That's all. That's all. And carry on and make your decision and bismillah, whatever decision you've made, I don't have to be a party of it. I really don't. You can make a decision and wallahi, we love everyone. Even the guys who disagree with us and call us biggest of names. We love them. We'd love to see them in paradise. And wallahi, that's the whole reason why we have to say what we are saying. Because the hatred that we have today in this global, you know, in this world, and I've come a long way by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm trying to help you to do the same. And perhaps you might already have come even a longer way than me, so I would learn from you. But to be honest with you, why I say I've come a long way in a certain matter, and that is to understand how temporary this world is. Wallahi, it's very temporary. Once you understand that you have to die, even a man like Steve Jobs, and I was reading this article last week, Steve Jobs said, once you know that you are dying, everything becomes irrelevant. Your fears are gone because the, the, the worldly fears are all out. You have to get out to achieve what you have to before you die. 
Now that's from a non-Muslim perspective. What about us? I know I'm going, but what am I doing as a result? What have I done? Am I still fearing people? And when you get to the grave, Allah will say, I gave you position in society such that people would hear what you had to say. And you knew something and you kept it to yourself and you allowed people to do what you believed was absolutely unacceptable. So why then were you a scholar of Islam? Why then were you a religious figure who people looked up to and you remained silent? I I cannot face the punishment even for a second for that. So I just pressed send and it's, it helped take me out of the muck. That's all. What people have done with that send is none of my business. Even the messenger وسلم, his duty was just to convey. Once the message is conveyed, it's over. What you do with it is up to you. And to be honest with you, people might still be confused. Do me a favor, read research find out take a look at the country take a look at the nation take a look at what's going on people tell you that you know what there is no second hand vehicle coming into this car but every day a few thousand are crossing the border allahu akbar so these type of things you need to understand you need to know and you need to also realize that it takes years for people to develop courage sometimes may allah help us and like i said the love we have and this is something we all need to learn. If you have a petty difference in this world with someone for some reason, don't let it make your hatred overtake you to the degree that you lose your calmness. There might have been a time even in my life when I did and I would lose my cool and calm. But now you relax. You know, people can say what they want. You know, people can swear you back and you say, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, they read it. That's it. That's all I need you to know. That's it. Someone swears you in return, say Alhamdulillah. Why Alhamdulillah? They're talking about it. That's it. They're talking about it. Allahu Akbar. You know, it's called conscientizing. The other day, I was somewhere and people were talking about, I was in Qatar. And someone was talking about a product and, you know, a flopped product. And this man who was part of the company says, I'm so happy they're talking about it. He says, why? They're advertising my company for free. Allahu Akbar. They're advertising it because now people are going to want to know and want to find out. When they find out, they'll know that, okay, there was an error with one thing, but there's another 20 things. So basically, I learned from that, that when people start talking about things, even if it's very negative speech, even if they tell you, I don't, I don't give a damn and I don't this, the fact that they're talking about it is already a sign of success. That's all. It, no, not what they're saying is irrelevant. It's like, for example... Something I learned, you know, when I was a little bit younger, we used to get stressed when people are talking nonsense about you. It happens. Now you thank Allah. Ya Allah, that's, I was taught by my scholars that the test of success is to count your critics. You know, they used to call it the CC test, counting critics. If you have very few critics, you're a flop and a failure. Oh, and I never understood it. Later on in life, I started understanding this guy is picking on you because you're first in class. That guy is picking on you because you're the top guy. This guy is picking on your kid because he came first. This guy is picking on this because it's a top school. This guy is picking on that and they pick on it. So if they haven't picked on you, brother, what do you have? Has anyone picked on you? No. Hey, hang on. Just go and make dua back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, no one's picking on me. You know, you know, Imam, there is a sheikh of the Hanafi Madhab. His name is Ibn Abidin al-Hanafi Shami. Rahmatullah, he passed away a long, long time back. He used to say, nasi man asha nasi yawman ghayra mahsudi. The worst of people are those who live in the midst of others without anyone being jealous of them. Because it means they've got nothing. So it means a sign of your success is when people are jealous of you. That's how you say, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, I thank you. We get depressed when people are jealous of us. But we don't realize, had we not had anything, they wouldn't have been jealous. So if you say, oh Allah, I don't want them to be jealous. Allah says, okay, take back the thing I gave you. Would you like it? No, 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 bring it back. But they're going to be jealous. So you either want it and then be jealous of you, or we take it away and everyone will be happy with you. You know, people don't, uh, you know, there's a saying about kicking a dog that's lying and so on. But to be honest, let's not use that saying. People do not actually become jealous of someone who's just a vagabond, someone who's just, for example, a person on the street, a street kid and so on. Do you ever say, hey, I'm jealous, this guy gets a dollar from every driver. Yo, would you ever think that? Never, but he gets a dollar. He earns more than some of you and I. Do you know that? We don't know. I was counting the other day. If every traffic light stopping, he gets just a dollar. Allahu Akbar. Or every second or third or fourth, he's earning about 80, 90 bucks just in one morning. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Anyone wants to change their jobs? MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease.
So this is the thing. So don't we owe a dua to the family of Muhammad sallallahu who suffered the most. They struggled. They never gave up on him. Astaghfirullah. They wouldn't. They never gave up on the deen. They took the flak. The husband sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tortured. He was harmed. They swore him. They called him names. What did he do as a result? What did they do? It's not easy to be a wife of a person who's being battered by entire community. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us and our wives and our families. So blessings and salutations upon them too. Because they have also carried for us the knowledge of what occurred behind closed doors. Had it not been for them, we perhaps wouldn't have had the knowledge of much of what happened behind closed doors in terms of intimacy and relationship with spouses and so on. Today we are flopping in our relationships in our homes because we haven't studied the home of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa his wives carried it. Aisha radiallahu anha says, and it's amazing. Let's start with Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. He was a servant. You know what's a servant? One who serves. He was a young man, a servant. He's, he was brought to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And amazingly, he says, Khadimtu Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ashra sinin. I had the privilege and honor of serving Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for 10 whole years. Imagine 10 years. Ten years, I served him. فَمَا قَالَ لِيَ أُفٍ قَطُّ He never ever made a sound of rejection towards me, such as uff or uh. You know, like sometimes, you know, the maid does something, uh, and these people are actually paid people. And this man was a servant, without payment, just a servant. So if, if the maid does something, and we just say... That's equivalent to the oof that we're talking about. You know, it's the T-S-E sound, T-S-I sound. Not the V-W-T-S-I, but the T-S-I sound, okay? Like that. So, so subhanallah, we would fail. But what happened, he says, he never ever said oof to me. وَمَا قَالَ لِيَ وَمَا قَالَ لِيَ أُف مَا قَالَ لِيَ أُفٍ قَطُّ وَمَا قَالَ لِشَيْءٍ صَنَعْتُهُ لِمَا صَنَعْتَهُ not once in 10 years did he say, why did you do this to something that I did? Not once. Imagine with us, our wives, why did you do this? Hey, hang on, you're not even supposed to say that to your servant. Where? What about me? You don't know the sunnah enough. Or you're not serious about following the sunnah. For you, the only sunnah that's the biggest one to follow is polygamy. That's it. Talk about it whole day. It's polygamy. Yes, sunnah, sunnah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Yes, it, it, it is. It's something that is there. But it's not the only thing in, in, in the book of sunnah. There are so many other things, Allahu Akbar. There are much more important matters. But anyway, let's get back at that. I see the men were not too pleased with what I just said. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. He carries on and he says, مَا مَسَسْتُ خَزَّنْ وَلَا دِيبَاجًا وَلَا حَرِيرًا أَلْيَنَ مِنْ كَفِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم. He adds, and I'm just adding this because it's part of the hadith and it brings tears to my eyes. He says, Wallahi, I have never felt anything smoother or softer, neither in silk nor in any form of material that was softer or smoother than the hand, the blessed hand and palm of Muhammad sallallahu Imagine how it must have been. Shake his hand, soft, softer than silk. That's what he says. Softest thing ever. Then guess what he says? And this last part makes me, really, it makes me tremble. He says, وَمَا شَمَمْتُ مِسْكًا وَلَا عَمْبَرًا أَطْيَبَ مِنْ عَرَقِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. I've never ever smelt any fragrance, whether it's musk or amber, more fragrant than the blessed persper perspiration of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Imagine. These were the miracles of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. He used to collect his perspiration in a bottle. Allahu Akbar. May Allah bless us. May Allah grant us ease. That was for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today you find some people, they find some Mawlana from, from India, having used an oil, perhaps made a little bit of, you know, the pickles that we have in our food. And next thing, they want to collect that oil and use it for blessing themselves. In, and they are equating it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, where is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sweat? And where is the achar oil that people are using in their hair? That we want to perhaps add with our pickle. Astaghfirullah, a'udhu billah. I have to mention this because no one must think, hey, so it happened to him, it can happen to anyone else. He was the Nabi of Allah. He was the best of creation. He was the highest. Subhanallah. And this is why I always say, well, if the man, uh, you know, I, I always say, if the man was a Nabi, then perhaps that could have happened. But he's not a Nabi. Like one man came to me and said, you know, my son, 
He married someone I disagree with. And I said, well, were you marrying her? He says, no. So I said, so he man, he's going to sleep with her, not you. Allahu Akbar. So you want, he says, no, but I had chosen someone for him. Uncle, you chose someone for yourself and you made a mistake, imagine. Now let him choose. Allahu Akbar. May Allah bless us. Because uncle, you've been to me complaining about your wife so many times. Uncle says, hey, you're not supposed to have said that. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I mean it in a nice way. Maybe your son might never come and complain because he's on cloud nine. You know? Allahu Akbar. It's easier to get to cloud nine because technology nowadays is much more advanced. May Allah forgive us. So he says, no. You don't know that even Ibrahim alayhi salam, it's so important that you listen to a parent when he told his, his uh, daughter-in-law that tell your son to change the, the, this doorstep of his. He meant divorce your wife and he came back and he d divorced her. Which means if I say divorce your wife, my son is supposed to divorce his wife. I said, uncle, yes. If you were Ibrahim alayhi salam, immediately he, he should have. And he, he must. And I agree with you. But are you a prophet of Allah? He said, no. So I said, well, there you are. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May He bless us. Really, we use our powers wrongly because we just you used to, you know, it's, it's typical of an Indian home or sometimes, a, you know, one of those older cultural homes where the father's the boss of guess who? Can I tell you? Can I recite it to you? He's the boss of the sons and the daughters. Mashallah, that's good. When they get married, he's the boss of all their spouses. And, and when they have children, he's the boss of all the grandchildren. And when the grandchildren want to get married, he's the boss of all those in-laws. And he chooses them and he makes sure that, hey, they're there. And he tells you what time you stand up and what time you sit down. If that's the case, it no longer works. It really no longer works. You have to lead a happy life by a non-interference policy. That's the happy life. Today, you guide your kids. That's your duty. Like we said, I'll talk to him, I'll explain to him, he's my friend. His decisions are his. Tell him, son, I've explained everything to you. Are you sure you still want to go for this? I really think you're making a mistake, but think about it a few days. If you still want to go for it, I'm there. Subhanallah, very few are able to do that, but those are the happiest homes. Those are the happiest homes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Some people confuse it by thinking that, oh, we were taught that you're not even allowed to tell your children anything. No, it's your duty to tell. Just like it was my duty to inform the community about something, whether they like it or not, is not my, my business. It's their decision. But I communicated. And good communication is essential for a healthy community. I learned that when I was at school. Subhanallah. You need to communicate. So I communicated. Alhamdulillah, you can just delete it and you can ignore it. So Alhamdulillah, but... The truth is, at least I fulfill my duty. Same applies to parents. We've, we've got children and we are worried because the new generation is very, very different from the old one. You know, the new generation, if you force them to do something, they will automatically become hypocrites. But when you convince them, they will do it even in your absence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So this is why we always say, may the blessings and peace be upon alihi, which means the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what powerful statement. So do not miss out the alihi. Have you heard it now? When you say, Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Add it. I, I, I actually would like to add it from now on, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It takes you a second more. Not even, a split second. But wallahi, the impact is huge. So anyway, we said, Wassalatu wassalamu ala abdillahi wa rasulihi muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. And may the peace and blessings be upon the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because wallahi they gave their lives. Do you know what? And I'm going to be blunt. And I'm going to hit on a red button. Well below the belt. Let's listen to this. And I'm sorry to be saying it. Allahu Akbar. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum sacrificed their lives. They died. They were martyred in order that the deen and the shahada and the rules of Islam got to us. So they were gone. They, they, Allah says, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ from amongst the men are those who have fulfilled their covenant and promise unto Allah. Some of them have already gone, they've been martyred, and others are waiting in order, subhanAllah, to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we find the Sahaba radiallahu anhum died. They literally gave their lives. They died of thirst and hunger, and they died in the battlefield and so many other places, so that you and I can know about what's right and wrong and how to worship Allah. And for us, we're not prepared to sacrifice a bone of chicken in order to save ourselves. Allahu Akbar. You see the difference? 
You see the difference? You're arguing about a bone of chicken. Brother, someone is disputing it, throw it out. Is the guy who's disputing it okay in his iman, perhaps, or okay as a Muslim? Do you think he's a reasonable fellow? If so, well, that means there's a question mark. If there's a question mark, Nu'man ibn Bashir tells us that he heard Rasulullah say, stay away. So we stay away, it's over. We don't need to comment. No one used the term haram, no one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Wallahi, it's something simple and logical. They, they were ready to give their lives for us. Guess what's happened? Today I was talking to someone and I was telling him, hey, it's so hard when there's a clash of interest between the belly of an individual and the halal certificate of a scholar. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, because when there is a sweet smell and you know you're hungry and everyone's raving about Burger King for example and and people are so impatient that they don't mind they just say hey guys let's go and eat ah, come on it's only chicken that's what's happened across the globe go to the states see what they do they tell you for their understanding of halal and haram ask the people from the states those who've traveled they think that or anything that is pork is haram for as long as it's not pork and crocodile, it's okay. So long as it's chicken and beef, it can never be haram. That's the, that's the understanding. And guess what? I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. Because that's the understanding. It's chicken. Nail it. Allahu Akbar. Nail it. May Allah forgive us. Even if it's fish, you need to know that they haven't put in their little champagnes and whatever else, the brandies and everything else that they use in some of the marinations and some of the whatever else, including cakes. I used to hear about it a while back. To preserve it, they spray some brandy. And it looks so nice. And people say, hey, is the cake halal? Don't be so sick. You don't have to slaughter a cake. Well, you don't slaughter the alcohol bottle either. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. So the truth of the matter is, we can, what are you ready to sacrifice for, your, for Allah? That's the question you must ask yourself tonight. Those people, why are we sending blessings and salutations upon them? Some form of sacrifice they made. So they are blessed forever. Ibrahim alayhi salam sacrificed a lot. What happened? We say his name in every salah. All the anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, they sacrificed. Those who gave their lives from the sahaba radiallahu anhum. What happened? We have to say radiallahu anh when we hear the name, no matter what. Because they sacrificed. They gave up things. They gave up their lives. Allahu Akbar, may Allah safeguard us. I hope we understand because wallahi, like I say, our duty is only to convey the message. The rest of it, well, Allah has given you a brain and me a brain and everyone else a brain and Allah has given us an understanding and He's given us the capacity. I swear if it was the law of tax and you were bringing in a vehicle duty free and someone told you, brother, you need this paper and the other guy says, nah, you don't. And someone says, I'm telling you, you need the paper. I know, I saw it with my eyes. You need this paper. What would you do? Because your vehicle is $80,000. Hey, you're not going to risk it. Get the paper. It doesn't cost you anything. You, you might, uh, you know, struggle a little bit more, but you make sure, hey, because someone is saying that this is needed, so let me have it. So now I've got it. Everything is in order. When you're applying for a visa to go somewhere and, they, and someone tells you, you need this, you need this, you need this. Trust me, go and apply for a visa, for example. Some of the countries don't even ask you a thing, but they can if they wanted to. Sometimes they don't even ask you a question. And you brought all your documents and you're like, hey, I suffered for you putting this thing together. It took me a month, man. And look at this guy. In two minutes, it's over. Okay, that's, that's what we should be learning from. That we are ready to sacrifice for a journey. We are ready to sacrifice, for example, for a, a deal, for a motor vehicle. What about for our iman? Because the contamination of the mind starts with two things. With the contamination of what goes into your mouth and the contamination of the company you are around. Two things. So be careful. In fact, so much so, Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in tattakullaha yaj'al lakum furqana wa yukaffir ankum sayyatikum wa yaghfir lakum. Oh, you who believe, if you are going to be conscious of Allah, fearing Allah, the term taqwa means to create a barrier between you and the punishment of Allah. If you are going to actively create a barrier between you and the punishment of Allah, we will give you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, between good and bad, between left and right, between the light and the darkness. We will give you the ability to distinguish between good people and bad, between the correct choices and decisions and the wrong ones. When? When you have actively tried to protect yourself from the fire that Allah has prepared. 
Taqwa Allah. That's what it means. When you are fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he says, and if you do that, we will also forgive your sins. We will expiate the sins you've committed and Allah will grant you elevation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. So the term taqwa Allah would mean to abstain from that which might get you into hellfire. Might. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness and may he open our doors. Like I say, I don't lose a second of sleep by the will of Allah. The reason is you do things with a clear conscience. You've, you know, you haven't really... If certain things, for example, someone was telling me, hey, you know what? Why did you say, why did you have to say this? And I said, look, it was my duty unto Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, to be honest with you, it's my duty unto Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, I had to be as clear as I could because without being that clear, people would not have understood the magnitude of the crisis. And people still think that, you know what, there's nothing wrong, Allahu Akbar. But it's up to you, no problem. You don't have to think there's something wrong. For as long as you read it, that's all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Now we get to the end of that, the statement that we start with. And that is, the Ashab Rasulullah sallallahu wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. And then usually we add something. And we add something, I'm sure a lot of you have heard it. وَمَنْ تَبِعَهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ And oh Allah, send blessings and salutations. Firstly, we started with Muhammad sallallahu We mentioned his family and we mentioned the reasons why his family is included. Some of the reasons. And then we mentioned the companions. The companions meaning the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And then we say, And all those who have followed them with goodness up to the end of time up to the last day. That would include anyone who followed that example and that pattern and that path with goodness and they taught others. So this is why I spend a moment a lot of the times to say, Oh Allah, bless all those who have struggled through the generations in a way that we'll never know. If our, if our society and community is going through a small speed hump that's made of perhaps sugarcane, to be honest with you, and that's a proper description if you compare it to what others are going you know, through. We take a look at it as though, hey, this thing's going to burst my tire. This thing is this, this thing is that. To be honest, it's so easy. It's so simple. And it's, it's full of, you know, simplicity in comparison to what others have gone through and are going through across the globe. There are people who have had to hide the entire Quran and their whole identity of the deen for generations. And they've had to dig underground dungeons in order to keep the Quran and to teach it to their children with a lantern and with a small, perhaps, you know, torch, something that was so difficult. And the children had to learn by looking at a book once only, learn about what happened in Russia and the Russian countries a long time back and you will see those people struggled and subhanallah the striving that they went through was unmatched the most of the scholars of Islam and Hadith came from that part of the world not from the Arabian Peninsula did you know that? who was Imam Bukhari? he was from there subhanallah who was Imam Muslim? who were the others? who were the top scholars of Islam? they were from there where is Samarkand? Where is Bukhara? Where are these areas? They're there. Why? They were persecuted to the extent. We have, you know what beats me? Is we have, mashallah, enjoyment of freedom today in a beautiful country of this nature. What are we waiting for? We're still not following. Allahu Akbar. You have the freedom of dressing as a proper Muslim should. And how is our dress? I'm not picking on anyone. And this is something, you know, those who know me personally would know that I, I'll just say it. I don't mean to attack you in person or anyone else. But we have to say it. It's an encouragement for me. It's an encouragement for you, for everyone. May Allah forgive us. Really, we all have shortcomings, myself included. And like we are taught by our scholars to say, and our, our elders to say something and to mean it. And that is, I do not know of anyone more sinful than myself. Did you hear what I just said? Why? It's a fact. I do not know of anyone more sinful than myself. Do you know why? Because my sins, I'm certain about them. I know them. I know them properly. Your sins, I don't know them. Even if I've seen you doing something, you could have asked Allah's forgiveness could be wiped out. Who am I to talk about it? So the reality is every one of us should be telling himself or herself, I do not know of anyone 
more sinful than myself. I'm the most sinful from whom I know and from the sins I know of the people. Because if Allah forgave them, what about me? May Allah forgive me. I would have lost, but if Allah forgives me, then Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm successful. So successful are not those who tread this earth saying that they were more holy, but successful are those who look at themselves with so much of concern that they succeed on the day that success means something. And this is why you take a look at these scholars. None of them have ever bragged about their salah. Nobody has ever said, I'm a good Muslim because I read my five salah in the first saf. Not one of them. Because they know salah can be taken away. The hadith says some of those who will be burning in hellfire will be those who read salah in the first saf all the time. But they, back, they were engaging in backbiting, slander, deception and everything else. And what happened as a result, they gave their salah to this one and the other salah to that one and they came back with no salah. And in fact, they had nothing left to give people whom they had wronged. So they began to take the sins of others. And in that way, they were thrown into hellfire. Is that what we want to happen to us? The answer is no. So remember something, don't let it make you feel that hey I'm a cool dude because I'm a good Muslim I need my five salah so you guys need to listen to what I've got to say relax it's good not got to do with that no one has ever bragged about it did Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi ever say that I read five salah so now you must listen to what I have to say in my book not once did he say that it's something that everyone should be engaging in and that is salah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us so it's important if we want to be included in this blessed prayer that is on every pulpit and most of the time it's repeated subhanallah millions of times a day by the billions of Muslims that are around then all we need to do is try our best to follow the example of Rasulullah when they say Waman bi ihsanin ila you say Allahumma ja'alna minhum May Allah, oh Allah, make us from amongst them. Which means when we say blessings and salutations upon those who followed or those who follow right up to the last day, we are asking Allah, oh Allah, make us from amongst them. May Allah forgive our sins. My brothers and sisters, what a beautiful evening. We have weather that is unmatched, as warm as it might be these days. And we know the global warming. But wallahi, thank Allah. There are people who I met from Australia lately and they were explaining to me because I've always heard that Australia is one of the places where the weather can take on Zim. And the truth is, they said, hey, it's humid, you know, it's quite humid there. And you know what? Look at us. Where's the humidity? Heat without humidity is for us. I think it's much more easily uh, handleable, if I can use that word, than a person uh, who finds himself within humidity. Subhanallah. For me, if it's extremely humid, it becomes, you feel like it's difficult to breathe and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Don't take the gifts of Allah for granted. I want to end with one thing. The reason is, Allah says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ if you are going to be thankful, I will grant you increase in what I've blessed you with. You're going to get more and more. But when you are ungrateful, you show ingratitude. I, my punishment is severe. Not only do I snatch away what I've given you, but on top of that, you are faced with conditions that you never ever thought of. Do you know that as beautiful a life as we are leading, the volatility of it is such that it's never been this volatile before. What does that mean? Take a look at a global level. Take a look at any level you want to look at it. Your own finances and mind, your health and mind. There are diseases that have wiped out healthier people than you and I in a split second. There are mass accidents that have taken people without them even having said goodbye to anyone. There are things that have happened. There are political events that have taken place across the globe. And in any, any place that people are living in that have made it such that you never know when a spring is going to be. May Allah save God us all and may Allah grant us peace and stability in this country wallahi one of the biggest gifts of Allah after iman uh oh it's not a piece of chicken allahu akbar <laughs> it is aman and aman derived from the same root iman is is the belief in Allah and then you have Amn and Aman, which is peace and stability, security. SubhanAllah, have you thought of it? Peace, more important than food and drink, more important than anything else. What type of peace? 
Allah promises you when you have Iman, you will have internal and external peace. May Allah grant that to us. So let's not think that it cannot be snatched away from us overnight. There are people elsewhere where things have been taken for granted. So, you know, it came overnight. They struggled. But with us, alhamdulillah, there's much hope. But at the same time, you know, anything could happen. The rainy season, take a look at the flooding across the globe. Who said it cannot come to us? But we continue to pray. And we will continue to have hope in Allah. But there must be some deeds that we are doing for Allah that would result in us at least deserving the mercy of Allah, even if it's a little bit. Because believe me, when we don't deserve the mercy of Allah, we're asking for trouble. It's like, you know, you're swearing a man day and night and you're asking him for help. This, this is even worse. So my brothers and sisters, I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. May He grant us love. May He grant us unity. May He grant us a goodness. And remember, unity has got nothing to do with difference of opinion. That is something that people confuse. Unity has got nothing to do with difference of opinion. You know, you might read a Shafi'i way. I might read a different way. Uh, someone else might read another way. That's not disunity. You might believe that you can eat, for example, uh, prawns and you can eat, for example, crayfish. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. Uh, I might not believe that. That doesn't mean we're disunited. You might feel that a certain place is halal and I might not feel that. That doesn't mean we're disunited. Let's not misinterpret this. It does not mean we're disunited. It means we, sh we have a difference of opinion and alhamdulillah it's good enough. I mean, you can have difference of opinions with your best friend as well. But don't let it make you think for a moment, hey, we're disunited, disunited. That's the wrong word. There's actually a little bit of confusion and sometimes difference of opinion. So that doesn't make us disunited. We still love each other. And I promise you, if a man who might hate my guts was involved in a little crash, may Allah safeguard us, or I was, I'm sure that we would rush to each other's assistance without taking a look at it and saying, ah, that guy, he deserved that to happen. No, I don't think our hearts are as dirty as that. And if they are, they should be cleansed. Because at the end of the day, like I said, life is very temporary. Perhaps that one little good deed of yours might be your key to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us at least some form of key to Jannah. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala Muhammad.